seconds for survival. That makes you think of wars and surprise attacks and our means to defend ourselves and retaliate. But sex survival is also a human story. Most of us have had seconds for survival many times in our daily lives. It happens to people at play on a day when the world is a picture of peace and serenity. Then the teletypewriter springs to life and the words chatter a threat to pleasure craft and their crews. Storm coming up. Head for shore. Head for shore. Thanks to quick warning and swift reaction to the danger, everyone is safe. People at work on a busy day. Ed Brown's been on the job for 20 years, never had one interruption in his daily routine. But then... All right. Okay, let's have it. All of it. The silent alarm alerts the police. Quick reaction, and a dangerous man is caught in his tracks. People at home on a Sunday afternoon, taking it nice and easy. That is, all except Dad. But Sunday's too nice a day to work. Wrap it up and join the family. fire is averted, again by prompt reaction. Since man's earliest days, he has relied on swift reflex actions to stay alive when danger threatens. Our military leaders took this as a lesson in planning the defense of our continent. They say that today, when a surprise attack would allow us only a few minutes warning, our defense system must be able to detect the enemy and react as quickly as a human being. To that end, the United States and Canada decided to give this continent eyes, brains, and muscles that could react as swiftly as yours and mine and with even greater efficiency. It seemed at the time an impossible goal. But let me tell you what we actually have today. To detect jet bombers long before they reach our shores, rings of radar eyes have been built across the northern part of the continent. We also have radar looking out to sea, in land-based installations along our coasts, in towers planted offshore, in picket ships, airplanes and blimps. Many of these radar posts serve as eyes for the SAGE air defense system, which can automatically identify, track and direct the destruction of enemy planes. If an enemy attacked, the alert would flash to the brains of our whole defense system, to NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command headquarters in Colorado Springs. At the same time, civil defense agencies would warn the people in our cities. Then our muscles in the form of jet interceptors and surface-to-air missiles would get into action, 
while our long-range bombers and missiles are on their way to destroy the enemy's bases. All of these eyes, brains, and muscles give us strength. But we need one more thing, perhaps the most vital element of all, a nerve system over which communications can be flashed in an instant's time so that our defense system can spring into action in one controlled thrust. Our military leaders knew this continent already had such a nerve system, designed for peacetime use, but ready to serve the cause of defense. Much of this nerve system is hidden underground, but there are places where you can see it clearly against the sky. I'm speaking of the nation's telephone network, whose microwave towers and cables lace the farthest village and town into a vast web of communications. This is a system that makes our defense go. It's the same network you use when you pick up your telephone to call someone in a distant city. And it's the same network the nation uses to carry on its daily business. Almost everywhere you look, you can see the vision of Alexander Graham Bell in millions of telephones carrying the voices of a nation and in the facilities and services which bring you news television programs, and the pictures you see in your newspapers. And telephone networks today don't stop at the waterline. We have underwater cables that span the oceans. They're important to overseas communications because they're not affected by magnetic storms and other atmospheric disturbances. These cables provide instant all-weather communications with Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico, and Cuba, Great Britain, continental Europe, and with our overseas military bases. Today's telephone network far exceeds Mr. Bell's grandest dream. And every last inch of it can be linked together to serve the home, business, or continental defense. The very size and diversity of this network helped to make it strong. But telephone companies have taken many other steps to ensure reliable communications during times of disaster. All across the country, trained people stand ready with emergency supplies and equipment. If electric power to telephone buildings should be knocked out, batteries and generators are ready to take over. And more underground cables are being installed across the country, providing additional alternate circuits that can withstand damage from storms or falling bombs. And to make this system even more dependable, telephone men have built great networks of communications that bypass critical military targets. Express routes reaching across the nation avoid large cities entirely. Other main routes connect with the express routes and go around the big cities as well as between them. If any of these cities were destroyed, communications could bypass them and continue to give nationwide service. I think we can all begin to see that the very same knowledge, manpower, and organization that brought the telephone into our homes also plays an important part in the defense of our country. The Bell Telephone Companies, the research facilities of the Bell Laboratories, and the manufacturing and supply organization of Western Electric have all been called upon to help design and build the special communications, weapon systems, radars, and other facilities for our continental defense. To me, the building of this great defense system is one of the most dramatic stories I have ever heard. In 1953, recognizing the threat of surprise attack over the North Pole, the governments of the United States and Canada decided to construct the Dew Line, the distant early warning line across the northern boundaries of Alaska, Canada, Greenland, and Iceland. Western Electric was assigned to supervise construction of this chain of radar stations in a land so remote that in some areas no human had ever walked before. From all over the country, telephone men journeyed to the far north as part of an organized team. Thousands of tons of equipment and provisions had to be brought into the frozen wilderness by plane, ship, and tractor train, any way you could get it there. But eventually, the supplies were there, and the job could move ahead.
For the men who built the dew line, it was a time of unbelievable hardships in bitter winds that blew across the Arctic wastes. In freezing cold, and through long months of lonely isolation. But despite blizzards and icy gales, the builders somehow persevered. And eventually, station by station, the dew line became a reality. A living electronic system that can give us precious minutes of warning time if an air attack should come from the north. Today, from stations clinging to wild and remote cliffs, Radar antennas probe deep into the skies above the top of the world. Vigilant sentinels that never close their eyes. Providing reliable communications in this wild north country was quite a problem. In the land where many people had looked to the dog sled and the bush pilot for their only contact with civilization, telephone men used a new kind of transmission to construct not only the dew line, but the Alaskan communication system, known as White Alice. And the silent land became electronically alive. Huge antennas designed by Bell scientists beam powerful microwaves over the horizon to be received and relayed by other antennas. Today, White Alice ties together our Alaskan military outposts and connects with the dew line to complete our communications network across the top of the continent. If enemy planes should try to fly in across our northern borders, the dew line antennas would spot them. And men on duty would observe their tracks on radar scopes. The information would flash to NORAD. To me, NORAD symbolizes the cooperation between the armed services of two countries, the United States Air Force, Army and Navy, and the Royal Canadian Air Force jointly operate this key headquarters. NORAD is a busy place. Information flows in by wire and radio from many different radar detection posts. In addition to radar stations at strategic points along our coastlines, Many others far out at sea give us extra minutes of warning time if attack should come from across the oceans. NORAD has the whole continent in its control. Communications facilities which enable officers in one room in Colorado Springs to see at an instant an entire battle situation so that they can plan and execute the strategic defense. Wherever an aircraft moves anywhere across or near our continent, the chattering teletype machines will deliver the information to be instantly marked on the map. NORAD then coordinates the overall defense, passing information to combat centers throughout the country, while men inside the strange-looking concrete buildings of SAGE would control individual segments of battle. SAGE combat centers can calculate the speed, altitude and course of enemy planes and direct the defense in their area. Through communication circuits, they can send jet interceptors into the sky toward the enemy. Bring them at supersonic speeds to the correct position for attack and electronically fire their rockets for the kill. All this from a command position hundreds of miles away. Through special signals flowing over telephone lines, SAGE also directs the launching and flight of surface-to-air missiles to strike swiftly across the skies at speeding enemy planes. Meanwhile, from Strategic Air Command headquarters, located deep underground in Omaha, Nebraska, the men who command one of the mightiest air forces ever assembled would alert the fleets of intercontinental jet bombers based all over the world. SAC crews are always ready to fly the big nuclear-armed bombers within minutes of a warning signal. Whatever these bases are, in Africa, Europe, or the Middle East, communications facilities tie them into a unified instrument of command. If our continent were attacked, this red telephone would be lifted from its cradle 
and instantly, SAC bases and aircraft in flight all over the world would be alerted. And upon command from the White House, the United States would launch the greatest counterattack in history. From SAC headquarters, commands would also go to the control rooms of our newest long-range weapons, the ballistic missiles. The giant missiles would thunder into the sky toward the target thousands of miles away. An enemy who would dare attack us would feel the punishment of devastating retaliation from points all over the globe. And at home, communications would help protect us all through an extensive warning network operated right from NORAD headquarters. This communications network, known as the National Warning System, connects to 400 cities throughout the United States and is linked with Canada's civil defense system. Civil defense personnel at NORAD would send a warning over this network. We fanned out further over state and local civil defense networks to the people across the country. Up to now, we've seen the vast defense network America has built to defend against attack by nuclear bombers. And we must continue to guard against that threat as long as any potential enemy has one planes. But today, we face an even more terrible danger. The intercontinental ballistic missile. This is a threat our leaders know we must meet. But it poses almost unbelievably complex problems. For one thing, we have to find the missile in time to take defensive action. To do this, the United States is building the largest radar antennas in the world in Greenland and Alaska, with another planned in Great Britain. These giant radar antennas are the eyes of Bemuse, the ballistic missile early warning system, which will be able to see an enemy missile more than 2,000 miles away. But Bemuse will have more than eyes, it will have voices too. Circuits that carry information back to Northern. These circuits are of the most vital importance to the system, for in a missile attack, time, time for survival, is the essential factor. Scientists are studying other methods of detecting enemy missiles, including the possibility of placing a series of satellites in orbit. They can keep a constant lookout and flash a warning the moment an enemy rocket engine is fired up on its launching pad. But even if an ICBM attack were detected, it would require the most fantastic weapon of them all to defend against it. An anti-missile missile, which must be able to launch itself high into space within seconds. Search out its target, moving up 15,000 miles per hour, and destroy it while still far from our shores. Because of its reputation in the design of military weapons systems, Bell Laboratories was asked by the Army to develop a system which could defend against the ICBM. A fantastic assignment. But the Nike Zeus anti-missile system could become the weapon of tomorrow. In almost all of its aspects, defense today is a venture into miracles. Living electronic miracles in which the dreams of Alexander Graham Bell emerged with the visions of missile and weapons engineers to build a wall of shelter around this continent. Time, time for survival is the essential factor and communications makes it possible. It was almost two centuries ago that George Washington said, if we desire peace, it must be known at all times that we are ready for war. On Pearl Harbor Day, the American people had cause to regret that they had all but forgotten Washington's advice. But what about next time? Will we once again be caught unprepared? Will the seconds for survival tick away until time has run out for us all? Suppose the next time the enemy strikes with jet bombers from three sides. From the east. From the west. 
and from the north, and with ballistic missiles in one coordinated attack. How would we cope with it? Radar at distant dewline stations will detect the bombers while it's still hundreds of miles away from our shores. I've got two. Pick them up at 035. Picket ships far out at sea will track on their scopes. Contacts at 265. Early warning aircraft on patrol will keep the planes under surveillance. 052, two tracks. In this crisis, communications will be needed as never before, when our very existence will depend on getting the information through to defense headquarters. All we know is they're not ours. I'll call you right back. They're coming in low. Altitude yes, 500. Yes, considerable numbers. Speed 500. Indicates no change. Our estimate heading. is at least 25 aircraft. Heading 85 degrees. Altitude 38,000. Speed they are 600. Unknown. Positions at 05, 10, 15. What's the report? The heading is now 280 degrees. Hotel Alpha, 21 reports 40 unknown. Yes, due north. Altitude 41,000. Speed 600 plus. 25 unknown. Kilo Zulu, whiskey 4. Heading unchanged. 278 degrees. No further word you're saying? Put me through to him, no will you? No confirmation on Hotel Kilo Zulu, Lima, whiskey Charlie, 4. Jigger 44. Roger, AD. We can't be certain until then. Foxtrot, Golf 42. That's all we have on them. Seem to be spreading. I want to check on that GRF right away. We're checking several reports. We'll reclassify. Nothing further in Alpha report. 321. Fox Easy's airborne. The whole continental defense system sprinted into a state of instant readiness for war. Airborne alert force. Stand by for proceed to target. We'll refuel that rendezvous, Marianne. What percentage? All stations Fully loaded at combat operation. Five minute alert. Delta Jigger. <laughs> Thirty interceptors airborne. Attention, all warning points. This, this is an air raid warning. OCDM. Emergency. Prepare to copy. This is an air raid warning. Confirmed. Hostile. Must be understood by all crews. bases. No hits. Slip through the conference. Delta call. jigger echo ball. Implement. Quick strike. Repeat. Quick strike. On full now. alert and ready to we launch. Have positive information. They are hostile. Sir, your conference call is ready. Put them on, please. The White House. By order from the White House. You are authorized to proceed. The decision is made. We strike back. Missile sites. Fire on designated targets. You may fire when ready.
scene of enemy planes. strength such as this which our leaders hope will discourage an aggressor and help to bring lasting peace. But if peace is to come, it can be attained only through vigilance, through readiness. The men and women of your telephone company will continue to contribute in every way they can to the defense of our continent in an age when seconds can mean surviving what we all pray for, peace. <laughs> Remember, military strength is not enough. We must also have civilian strength. With both, this country has a powerful deterrent force. Should war come in spite of this, a prepared civilian population, one that can survive a nuclear war, will make the difference between victory and defeat. For your preparedness, you should know and take action on these five fundamentals. One, Know the warning signals. Two, know your community's emergency plan. Three, know first aid. Four, know how to use Conelrad by tuning to 640 or 1240 on your radio to get official instructions. And five, construct a family fallout shelter and stock it with food, water, first aid kit, battery radio, and other emergency supplies. With such preparedness, survival is assured and peace is within reach. <laughs>